Uh, thank you, Omar and Leslie, for the invitation, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I graduated from the School of Architecture at the Cooper Union in 2008 and have only been back once in 2016 as a guest for a fourth year design studio critique session. So being back here stirs up a lot of memories. I hope you will bear with me. I would like to begin this talk by remembering my classmate, Joey Lawrence, with whom I have shared many a conversation and experiences in this very room. We are sitting in room 315, located on the third floor of Cooper Union's foundation building the floor dedicated to the Irwin Shannon School of Architecture. It is where the school's lectures and seminars take place. It is not a public venue. So the decision to host the talk here tonight is intentional. Part of the reason is personal, since I refuse to set foot in the new academic building where the intradisciplinary seminar public lectures usually take place. The other and more important reason is contextual. This is the room where I was taught most of the things that I know today and many of the tools that I have used over the past years in the making of my work as an artist. And sometimes, in order to confront that which has made us, one has to go back to the scene of the crime. On the morning of Friday, September 1st, 2006, I went to buy a cup of coffee from a shop on the ground floor of what was then Cooper Union School of Engineering Building on 3rd Avenue and 8th Street. As I was waiting for it, I noticed that someone had left their copy of the New York Times on the counter. The front page showed the photograph of trucks filled with debris from various sites around Beirut, slowly making their way to dump the rubble into the sea and produce a makeshift mountain. Close by stood an advertising billboard that featured Pigeon Rock, a natural landmark off the coast of Beirut that is a po popular tourist destination and one of Lebanon's national symbols. The caption read, a river of rubble from the war in Lebanon. Earlier that summer, the war between Israel and Lebanon had forced me to evacuate from Beirut to New York in order to come back to school. So finding that photograph moved me beyond words. I was struck by its composition, by the formal analogies it set up between the rubble and the geological formation. I was also interested in the fact that this was one of the rare photos of the conflict that did not feature any person. It was mainly about the material remains of that violent event being dumped in the water. If there was no caption and no reference, one could have easily mistaken it for something else or somewhere else. So, on my way out of the coffee shop, I stole the paper. Later that day, I came into this very room for the first meeting of my fourth year design studio class. The studio was called Cities of Catastrophe and was led by the late professor Diane Lewis. Following the devastating events of Hurricane Katrina, 
in 2005, several architecture schools across the US decided to use the city of New Orleans as a site of study and inquiry to develop urban and architectonic forms in response to the disaster. Cooper was one of them. But Professor Lewis's approach to the problem was going to be different. Rather than jump right into the study of New Orleans, the first half of the semester would be devoted to studying another city of our choice. The criteria for choosing that city was simple. It had to be a place that had gone through a natural or a man-made disaster. The idea was that by looking elsewhere, one might be able to find solutions for certain problems at home. I decided to look at Beirut and at one particular moment in the history of the city that took place inside the National Museum. In 1975, with the outbreak of the Lebanese Civil War, Beirut was split into two opposing areas. The National Museum fell on the demarcation line and became the site of constant battles. The chief curator of the museum and his wife devised a way to protect the artifact during alternating firefightings and moments of truth. Their idea was that the vulnerable small artifacts would be hidden in the storerooms that would then be walled up. The mosaics installed in the floor were covered by a layer of concrete, and the statues and sarcophagi that constituted the bulk of the collection and were too heavy to be moved were encased in wood before concrete was poured atop them. The encasing of objects in concrete, which goes against any conservation law, protected the collection from 15 years of continuous shelling. Historically, a sarcophagus, a sarcophagus is usually made out of limestone, since lime has the property to accelerate the disintegration of the body housed inside it, hence the name sarcophagus, which means flesh eating. During the 15 years when the sarcophagi at the National Museum in Beirut were encased in concrete, the salt released from the concrete casing themselves started to disintegrate the limestone that made the sarcophagi. So, when the objects were finally exposed in the early 1990s, a new layer of history had been added to the surface of these historical artifacts. I was intrigued by this extreme measure and how an act that sounds at first destructive ultimately saved hundreds of objects from destruction. I was also intrigued by the material conundrum that this action produced. This peculiar gesture became the subject of my investigation for the Cities of, Dis of Catastrophe project. And when brought back to New Orleans, my proposal was to develop different types of encasing structures in varying scales that would protect objects, people, buildings, and neighborhoods, respectively, by allowing for the inevitable flood to penetrate spaces and create pockets of safety within them. But more importantly, I learned during that class that historical moments have material consequences, and that form is not imposed on a place, but comes out of an in-depth look at the various strata that make it. It became a tool through which I could see the world. <laughs> 
After graduating from Cooper in 2008, I went on to get my MFA from the University of California in San Diego, and in 2012, moved back to Beirut to set up my practice there. Since then, I have worked on several projects, ranging in scale and subject matter, that hold at their core a belief in the possibility for form and material to tell stories. Here are some of them. Steel Rings is a multi-part sculpture that replicates the now defunct Trans-Arabian pipeline in sections that take over the exhibition space and serve both as a record of an American multinational oil infrastructure in the Middle East, but also a possible form that could be contended with now that this infrastructure no longer serves a purpose. The Dead Sea in three parts is a sculpture that looks into the formal consequences of the 1948 UN partition plan of Palestine and the division of the Dead Sea between Jordan, Israel, and Palestine. Cyprus, an installation that repurposes the boat my father had rented in 1987 in his failed attempt to escape Lebanon to Cyprus, hanging in perfect balance with its anchor by way of a system of 20 complex pulleys. Colossus with Clay Feet, a work that confronts the destroyed marble columns from a 19th century Venetian style villa in Beirut with the concrete stress test samples of the skyscraper that came to replace it. Exquisite Corpse, an installation that, look, that looks into the complex and contradictory development of the single soldier tent, a military invention of the German army that was adapted and adopted by the French, the Russians, and the American armies in their subsequent attacks in the Gulf and North Africa that was based on the appropriation of a design devised by Bedouins to turn their jackets into tents when stranded in the desert. And finally, fragments, a multi-year multi-part series of works, the last chapter of which is currently on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a series that looks at the life and work of German archaeologist Max von Oppenheim and the complicated journey and fate of the objects he unearthed at the archaeological site of Tel Halaf, a village that sits today on the border between Syria and Turkey. In January 2019, Jose Esparza Tronqui invited me to develop a project for a show at Storefront for Art and Architecture. At the time, I was in the middle of preparing for my show at the Met and needed a distraction. So I welcomed the invitation and started to think of possible stories to tell there. Storefront had been an essential part of my education as an architect. So I started to think of architecture and of education. Since 2017, I have been splitting my time between Beirut and San Francisco. Soon after moving there, I went to Omega Salvage, a second-hand store in Berkeley, looking for furniture for my apartment. While there, 
I came across a pile of wood. The tag on them read, Redwood Corbels from the Julia Morgan Theater. I was intrigued by their shape, so I bought all 20 of them and started looking for Julia Morgan. Julia Morgan was the first woman admitted to the architecture program at the École Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts in Paris. Later, she became the first female licensed architect in California. And over the course of 42 years of active practice, designed more than 700 built structures, holding the record for the most completed works by any single American architect. In 1908, Morgan was commissioned by the St. John Presbyterian Parish to build a church for the growing influx of people moving from San Francisco to Berkeley following the 1906 earthquake. Morgan worked with a very limited budget, so there was no room for decorative elements. And the building became an example of what a pared down American craftsman style building can look like. In 1974, the congregation moved to a more modern sanctuary and the fate of the Julia Morgan building was uncertain. The desire to preserve it from demolition led to the formation of the Berkeley Architectural Heritage Association. Today, the building serves as the Julia Morgan Theater, a performing arts center, and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Even though Morgan had a career more extensive than most architects of her time, the sweeping changes brought on by the international style and its widespread discrediting of the Beaux-Arts training that was central to her aesthetic ultimately obscured her legacy. In 2014, 57 years after her death, Julia Morgan was awarded the AIA Gold Medal. She was the first woman to receive it. In 1951, shortly after closing her office, Julia Morgan burnt all of her files and blueprints, as well as most of her office records on the grounds that her clients had their own copies and that nobody else would ever be interested. I had never heard of Julia Morgan and her work was not taught in the history of architecture classes I took in this room. After buying the corbels from the salvage store, I learned that they had been used to hold up planters on the facade of the church and that they had been replaced in the 1970s before the building was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The carpenter in charge of the project had kept the corbels but decided to sell them to the salvage store when he ran out of space. I stored the corbels in my laundry room in San Francisco and knew that one day I will have to deal with them. Every time I go back to Beirut, I visit a second-hand store called Arc-en-Ciel. One day, I found a stack of old papers piled up on the side of a dusty shelf. The front page read, Précis de l'art arabe by J. 
bourgeois. Intrigued by the quality of the paper, I bought the stack and went looking for who this G. Bourgeois might be. In, in 1892, Jules Bourgeois, a French architect, draftsman, and ornamental specialist, published Précis de l'art arabe, that can be translated as a summary of Arab art, a series of 300 drawings documenting the architecture, carpentry, and ornamentation he had surveyed while taking part in the French archaeological missions to Egypt that took place between 1838 and 1884. In the publication, Bourgeois noted that the practice of studying ornamentation thus far was primarily based on facsimiles that allowed for exact replicas of the observed material to be reconstituted, but that also distanced the viewer and the maker from the reference objects. So he proposed an understanding of the objects as forms to be interpreted rather than material to be copied, as, as stylistic tendencies did not necessarily have to derive from cultural references. This document, among other publications by Bourgeois, became foundational text for what has been considered to be Arab art in the Western canon. And even though he was a pioneer in the study of art and architecture from the region, Bourgeois remains virtually unknown. I had never heard of Jules Bourgeois and his work was not taught in the history of architecture classes I took in this room. <laughs> While doing research on Jules Bourgeois, I learned that towards the end of his life, he was working as a drawing teacher at the École Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts in Paris, at the same time when Julia Morgan was a student there. I have yet to find proof that they actually met, but the imagination of this meeting ever happening became the trigger of my project for Storefront for Art and Architecture, an inquiry into the life and work of two prolific and yet forgotten figures by way of the leftovers of their practices found in salvage stores in Berkeley and in Beirut. The show at Storefront is composed out of three works. The first is a series of 300 collages made using the original copy of Bourgeois's book, Précis de l'art arabe. The process of making the collages consists of cutting into the drawings and folding the cuts backwards so as to reveal different possible new compositions that can be made out of the pages of a pseudo-scientific survey of Arab art. The 300 collages were laid out in four lines, following the original four sections in Bourgeois's book, architecture, carpentry, manuscripts, and details. The collages are hung using pins on a cork wall that runs across the entire 80 foot length of the gallery's back wall. In the middle of the gallery space stands a sculpture titled 
assemblage. The sculpture is made by stacking the 20 redwood corbels in an alternating way to create a makeshift column. When seen from the front, the sculpture borrows formal clues from the ideas of functional columns championed by the modernist aesthetic and later adopted by minimalism. But when seen from the side, the sculpture turns its head to showcase the slight curvatures of each corbels that denotes ever so slightly their belonging to a different school and style than the one the front proposes to be. Behind the sculpture hangs a bulletin board with a newspaper clipping from the 1910 announcement of the inauguration of St. John's Presbyterian Church, the 1974 full application to include the building in the National Registry of Historic Places, and the proof of purchase of the 20 corbels from Omega Salvage in 2017 for $600. Early on in the process of making the show, Jose asked me for a title. At first, I suggested Jules and Julia, a play on the title of one of my favorite French films, Jules et Jim. And then I thought about it again. In 1851, John Ruskin, the leading English art critic of the Victorian era, first used the term arabesque in relation to Islamic art in The Stones of Venice, his treatise on Venetian art and architecture. Arabesque is a French term that is derived from the Italian word arabesco in the Arabic style which in turn come from Arabo, the Italian word for Arab. The term was used in the 16th century in conjunction with Moresque, literally Moorish. It also has a relationship to grotesque, which originally referred to the ruins of Roman decorative arts from the caves, i.e. grotto, but came to be used to describe unconventional shapes and distorted forms. Over the next few centuries, the terms grotesque, moresque, and arabesque were used interchangeably in English, French, Italian, and German for styles of decoration that were derived as much from the European past as they were from the Islamic world. So over the past few decades, there has been several attempts by writers, thinkers, and historians to try and salvage meaningful distinctions between the words from the confused wreckage of historical sources. They have yet to agree on one. But what is certain is that there is no word for arabesque in Arabic and that the concept does not exist in that language. Storefront for Art and Architecture is known for its iconic facade, designed by artist Vito Acconci and architect Stephen Hall in 1993. Though the initial design was only intended to last for two years, the architecture has somehow stuck around. So it was only fitting that for the last work in the show, which gives the show its title, it had to be an intervention on that facade. Arabesque is a large format vinyl applied to the facade of storefront that spells out the word arabesque using Arabic letters. Since the word does not exist in the language, 
a transliterated version of it was used, further complicating the question of the formation of language and assumptions about styles that are assigned rather than actually studied. Arabic typography allows for the extension of certain characters in order to fill in gaps while writing. This rule that comes from calligraphy was used in the process of making the vinyl to break the word arabesque and extend it across the length of the facade, further deepening the divide between the beginning of the word and its end, even to people who can actually read what is written. Back when I was a student at Cooper, I was assigned to read Ornament and Crime, a text written in 1908 by Adolf Loss. The famous essay linked unornamented architecture with the culture of modernity, and in doing so, became one of the key formulations of modern architecture. Hence, a required reading in my history of architecture class in this very room. I will read you now the last chapter of this essay. I'm preaching to the aristocrat. I tolerate ornaments on my own body when they constitute the joy of my fellow men. Then they are my joy too. I can tolerate the ornament of the kafir, the Persian, the Slovak peasant woman, my shoemaker's ornaments, for they all have no other way of attaining the high points of their existence. We have art, which has taken the place of ornament. After the toils and troubles of the day, we go to Beethoven or to Tristan. This my shoemaker cannot do. I mustn't deprive him of his joy, since I have nothing else to put in its place. But anyone who goes to the Ninth Symphony and then sits down and designs a wallpaper pattern is either a confidence trickster or a degenerate. Absence of ornament has brought the other arts to unsuspected heights. Beethoven's symphonies would never have been written by a man who had to walk about in silk, satin, and lace. Anyone who goes around in a velvet coat today is not an artist, but a buffoon or a house painter. We have grown finer, we have grown more subtle. The nomadic herdsmen had to distinguish themselves by various colors. Modern man uses his clothes as a mask. So immensely strong is his individuality that it can no longer be expressed in articles of clothing. Freedom from ornament is a sign of spiritual strength. Modern man uses the ornaments of earlier or alien cultures as he sees fit. He concentrates his own inventiveness on other things. Needless to say, I failed that class. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.